And for more, we're joined by the CEO of the United States Studies Centre, Professor Simon Jackman. Simon Jackman, welcome back to ABC News tonight. Thank you. Uh, a little salvo there, um, not so cryptic from uh, Mr Cohen as he uh, left for the jail. Is he, does he still present a liability to Donald Trump? Yeah, potentially. Um, there's a lot of investigation still going on out of the Southern District of New York, that judicial district of the United States, so separately from Mueller. And remember, that's how Cohen found himself in jail, was being prosecuted up there in, up there in New York. Um, there is still plenty of investigation going on, and Cohen knows a lot about and, where the bodies are buried and, and could be helped. And he's cooperating, but how much is his cooperation actually wanted by the authorities, given his record of lying? And that's, a, that's, another, that's another problem he faces. Uh, as recently as, what, nine months ago, he was still lying to federal prosecutors. Mm. And so he is a tainted witness at best. That said, he perhaps he can be helpful in a behind-the-scenes way and earn back some of that credibility such that, you know, he may be in line for a due sentence down the road. What kind of conditions does he face in this prison? From what I'm hearing, he's going to one of the cushiest <laughs> federal facilities available in the US federal prison system. At the end of the day, though, prison is prison. And even though it's uh, upstate New York with bunk beds and... Um, and the occasional home visit. That's right. That's right. Um, he has a minimum security risk. Um, but nonetheless, you know, deprivation of liberty at the hands of the federal government is something, you know, not to be taken lightly. Uh, what's Donald Trump's kind of reaction been to all of this, particularly in the risk that Cohen poses in cooperating with the authorities? Well, you call him a rat, right? And it's remarkable the way by all accounts, how intense and how close those two men were over so many years to see, on a personal dimension, that breakdown, but then the ferocity of the Trump response, some of which may include obstruction of justice quite independently from the obstruction allegations being made with respect um, to what Trump did on the Russia investigation. Uh, to you, is that a sign of fear? Yeah. Yeah, because I think he knows um, where the bodies are buried up there in New York City around the Trump organisation, number one. And number two, I do think it's deeply personal um, for, for Trump. He values loyalty incredibly highly. Uh, Cohen turned um, on, on him and the family uh, in particular, and I think that pre uh, uh, presents a unique, singularly uh, unique threat to Trump and his family. Let's talk about the China trade talks. They've sure. been stalled for months now. Uh, Donald Trump seemed to uh, end that stalemate somewhat with a flurry of tweets about the trade talks. What did he say that seemed to bring this issue back to light? He tweeted out that um, unless um, the talks, quote, got on back on track, uh, or words to that effect, that the US would go very hard with a full range of tariffs by the end of this week. Um, now, I don't know the talks were stalled, to be honest. We were just in Washington a couple of weeks ago. Um, we did have some FaceTime with some of the people who are running those, those talks on behalf of uh, the American government. Um, I, I think there's an awful lot of back and forth going on under the surface. And, you know, it's un unsourced quotes, uh, unsourced um, uh, quotes on this uh, say that, you know, China was, was actually trying to walk back from some of the IP protections that the Americans are keen to get as part of a comprehensive deal. So particularly that the Chinese had moved towards changing some of their domestic laws to accommodate these compromises and then have since wanted to change the wording on it. That's primarily, from what I can gather, the main sticking point. Yeah, yeah. And that's a big deal for China. Um, and, and indeed, they did the Belt and Road Initiative, big, big annual uh, conference around that. One, one theory holds that uh, Chinese officials were feeling pretty emboldened after that. Um, a lot of discussion inside China that we don't have a lot of visibility on uh, and sort of gets reported second and third hand at best, um, that they were feeling as though they could perhaps not give as much away to the Americans on, on IP. Um, and, of course, that had the consequence, apparently, back in Washington, of, of causing a bit of a blow-up inside the White House and a blow-up from, from Trump himself. It seems as though the talks that were scheduled for May 9 and 10 with the Chinese Vice Premier, that they're going ahead? Yeah, so that's the other good news. So lots of news coming out on this very quickly, moving markets uh, literally in real time. Uh, but that is a great sign, as far as the markets were concerned, um, that this is the talks nonetheless are going to continue. 
um, and that, you know, serve and volley uh, point taken uh, by, by the Americans as far as the Chinese. Uh, markets reacting sort of reasonably well in the US, not so great in China because we saw, I think it was a 5% plummet um, when those tweets went out from Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. So clearly there's a, a sense that China's got more skin in this than the US is as far as the markets are concerned. That's one interpretation at the moment. And there's a few other things going on in China as well. Um, one is that it's sort of an interesting side story to all this is the, is the swine flu story over there with 40% of the, of the, of the pig uh, herd in China uh, facing uh, uh, extermination, to, to uh, elimination to, to deal so with... It's with... been likened to Ebola for the pig uh, yeah. population. And right. I think uh, China consumes like something like 30% of the world's pork. Right. And so prices have to go up. Um, it's potentially good news for exporters of pork, including... The United States. The United States. Mm. And so you overlay that on this, and so there's a lot going on at once. And China, I think one of the senses we came away um, from Washington with is that um, they really have rattled China's cage, number one. They've got their attention, and there is method in the madness that the tariffs at first instance seemed a crazy sort of way, flying in the face of, of everything that's been sort of considered e economic orthodoxy in international trade for a long time, but has certainly got the attention of the Chinese regime and, and certainly has got them to the table on the big sticking points, forced technology transfer and IP protections. So is there a sense that there could be some resolution at the end of these talks this week? I wouldn't hold my breath. I think there's an awful lot of gamesmanship going on. Trump wouldn't mind a win, but he doesn't mind the, the tension and the conflict going on and either. And I think the other thing to understand, the conversation in Washington around Trump on this, this is for all the marbles. This is a really big deal. And, and we're hearing that there's an intense internal argument inside the Trump administration as to do you declare victory now or do you keep prosecuting this case and really hold out for the reforms that you really want on IP and on, on forced technology transfer? Or do you score a relatively easy win now and, and go home and declare victory and perhaps give up meaningful progress on those longer term, potentially much more important issues over the longer haul? What about the prospect of China calling America's bluff and retaliating with its own set of tariffs, noting that the American tariffs, dollar value-wise, are more than twice the value of what China's imposed so far? Yeah, again, but I think we get back to this, who's, which, which economy at the moment is better positioned to whether the economic downside of that. And there's a lot of thinking around that says the US is at, 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 for the time being. So, so again, this is sort of, sort of a consensus we're hearing, not just from Washington, by the way, that the US may, at least in the, in the, in the short to medium term, be playing a pretty strong set of cards here. Now, we're moving to, uh, towards Wednesday now when the House Democrats are going to vote on whether to hold Attorney General William Barr in contempt of Congress for failing to turn over 36 different types of documents relating to the Mueller investigation. So that deadline, it's now coming into Tuesday morning, which is the final day of that deadline, right. before they vote on the Wednesday. Right. Is that going to eventuate? I don't know. I th I'm wondering, there just some things we're reading suggests that there is a bit of a scramble going on for a compromise. I wouldn't bet on it. And I wouldn't bet on it because I actually think this is part of the Trump's administration strategy, that having a bit of a fight with Congress, in fact, not having a bit of a fight, having a big fight with Congress... A very theatrical one. ...is how we get from here to the 2020 election. Um, a great piece by one of our um, fellows, Bruce Wolpe, is up on our website tonight at the US Study Centre, laying out this argument. What's the political logic behind that? And that is, he hasn't got much else to go on, but boy, oh boy, does his base love a fight with the base, and we will give them nothing, is our strategy. We will ignore every subpoena. They can hold us in contempt. It'll just show how powerless they are. And ultimately, they may have to bring on the ultimate sanction impeachment, which is a losing proposition for them and potentially great for us in terms of revving up our base and keeping our people close to us as we go towards 2020. Could it just play into the Democrats' hands, though, and their, uh, the prosecution of their argument that William Barr is simply a Donald Trump lackey? You would rather have perhaps that fight than handing over the documents, right? Because what's in the documents, what's in the tax returns that they won't hold over, that the Treasury Secretary has ordered the IRS not to hold, hand that over, um, dragging that out 
and, and go ahead, find us in contempt and we'll fight that in the courts as well. And just kicking everything over into the courts and slowing everything down. And, and what, what is terrible from a perspective of governance for the United States and, and you know, institution at war with the other institution of government, executive and, and legislature, but I think could potentially be quite an effective political strategy uh, for, for Trump. Who's, who's, again, holding a relatively weak set of cards. He lost the House. He's got a 40 percent approval rating. So just go to war with them. And, 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 and that's how you get from here to next November, November a year. How extensive is the access to the Mueller report? Because William Barr's defence is that the House Judiciary Chairman Jerry Nadler does have access to a minimally redacted version of that report and has refused to read it, and so he characterises that as being just completely unreasonable when the compromise has already been made. Um, they want it on the record. They want the whole thing, not just for them to read, which of course they can in a secure room um, over on the Senate side, at least of, of the of the Congress. Um, the, and moreover, they want to be asking way tougher questions in the context of a democratically controlled committee and chamber versus over on the Senate side, which is Republican controlled, and the, and the chair um, uh, of the committee the other day, Lindsey Graham, gave Bob Barr a pretty easy ride. Um, that wouldn't be the case if he fronted up for testimony over on the House side, where he's got a, a Democratic committee chair who wants to set his own lawyer, the committee's counsel, loose on Barr. And that's what Barr is taking particular objection to. I'll take your questions. I'm not going to take questions mm. from a real lawyer who's going to tie me up. And, and for 20, 25 minutes versus the five minutes sort of rapid fire is typically you get over on the Senate side we saw the other day. Do the Democrats really think there's something in there that they could use to impeach the president? They really Given want the tax, return, the tax yeah. returns in particular. But I think more detail on the obstruction case. But ultimately, I look, there was a great interview with Hillary Clinton the other night where she said, look, because she's, she w cut her teeth as a young woman working on the Watergate investigation. A lot of people don't realise that. When she was Hillary Rodham, one of her first gigs out of college was being a staffer on the Watergate investigation in 1974. And what was that? It's that slow drip of public testimony, sort of, if you will, rehashing what's there in Mueller, but in over a series of weeks and months with witnesses on television making those, releva those revelations will lead the news every night for, for a month or two. That's what the Democrats want. Um, they don't and, and they want that, but they also want those tax returns because the, 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 the thinking is that's where you're going to learn a lot about what's going on with Trump and, and, and his history in particular with Russia. Perhaps. Uh, now, there have also been some pictures of Donald Trump uh, celebrating a awarding of a Presidential Medal of Freedom uh, to Tiger Woods after he won the Masters tournament last month. Uh, this has got some people applauding and some people jeering. Why yep. is that? Well... Well, what's Tiger done? He's a, he's a great uh, golfer. Uh, and it's a, it, look, it's a great story to some extent, a story of some, you know, uh, uh, rags to riches to riches, uh, or riches to rags to, ri to riches, um, uh, redemption. And Americans love a redemption story. Um, but it reeks of a, of a political stunt to distract us from so much else that is going on in Washington at the moment. Particularly given that Tiger Woods has been a business associate of Donald Trump. And there's that as well, that they have done business together. Trump, uh, I believe, named a fairway or something, a uh, part of one a, of his golf well, courses. It was a residence or something. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah one of the time. resorts. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a long-time yeah. relationship. Um, and it would seem that... Even though they've known each other for a long time, a lot of people now who have been Tiger Woods fans are saying that they're no longer going to be Tiger Woods fans simply because of um, seeing Donald Trump put the Medal of Freedom around his neck. It's slightly unfair, isn't it? Uh, probably not. Um, <laughs> I've got to say, watching him win the other day, I, I watch golf about once a year. Yeah. But I, but I, and, <laughs> and that was my idea. I did tune in to see him win the other night. That was that was it was pretty remarkable to watch. Um, um, but but but. But Trump will go for that. That is, that is a story that Trump just will love. And, and, the, and the text Trump used in, in, in awarding him the medal, it just tells you a lot about sort of that story of, of, of come back and making it great in America. And, 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 and Trump was just going to be all over that. Yeah, I was asking whether it's unfair that Tiger Woods now has to lose fans because <laughs> of his association with Donald Trump, yeah, which, is, which, which, which people have known well about known. for a exactly. long time. Yeah, you're not really in a position to deny, though, <laughs> the, the, the being awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Yeah. I, I don't think that's something you say no to. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> just think it's, uh, it, it's extraordinary that, you know, that's when people prick up and go, oh...
that's the story yeah. of the camels. I don't yeah, feel too yeah. sorry for Tiger Woods, though. I think he's, he, he's, he's doing all right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he is indeed. Simon Jackman, uh, thank you very much for coming in. My pleasure. Thank you.